Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. Today I will talk on the drugs used in bronchial asthma. If you just carefully watch me as a patient of bronchial asthma, just see. You might notice that uh, there was a difficulty in breathing. There was what you call as a wheeze, which is indicates that the air flow from the, from the respiratory tract is with effort and that happens when the air goes from a, from a narrow track and then if you like put it air from here like a whistle, it creates a sound. So, what is bronchial asthma? Bronchial asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the respiratory tract and if I just put it, this is the normal respiratory tract, there is an inflammation and this because of this inflammation, there is a narrowing of the respiratory tract and this results into respiratory symptoms. And the first symptom, if you see a patient wheezing, wheezing means when you take respiration, inspiration, there is a typical sound which is indicative that the air flow is passing through a narrow passage. Because of the air does not go into the alveolar system, the exchange of gas takes place is less and therefore, there is a shortness of breath. With this, there is always a feeling of tightness in the chest and because of this air causes irritation in the respiratory tract, this often induces cough. When there is a difficulty in breathing, this induces sometimes cough and this cough itself causes severe irritation in the respiratory tract and this is a vicious cycle. So, this has to be a management if you say that you have to give a drug or drugs which can release the bronchoconstriction and if this is associated with cuff, then you may also have to treat the cuff so that the cycle is not continued. Usually bronchial asthma occurs in childhood that is called as a childhood bronchial asthma and in India many children suffer from bronchial asthma and particularly you might have been reading today that during Diwali season, during firecracker because of pollution, the incidence of bronchial asthma is, is almost increasing in logarithmic proportion. And this continues till adulthood in adult or adolescent when it is diagnosed, particularly when the children go for playing, when the children go for sports and they do a heavy exercise then this gets precipitated. So, bronchial asthma can happen in children which is more common in adolescent, but is also seen in adults at a later date also. Now, if you just see here, if you just see that this is the, this is the normal airway and if you just see this is the normal airway, the air goes from here 
and then this is the air trapped into the air goes into the alveoli where the oxygen exchange takes place. But when there is an asthmatic airway you can see that there is a narrowing of the lumen because of the wall of the of the respiratory tract is inflamed and that causes slight narrowing and if this wall gets thickened and also there is a tightened smooth muscle of the alveolar system or the tracheal system or the entire bronchioalveolar system then the flexibility of this is reduced and that leads to air trapping in the alveoli and that leads to poor oxygen exchange and that is what happens typically in asthmatic airway. Now, so the cardinal features in bronchial asthma symptoms is difficulty in breathing, wheeze sometime associated with cough, exhaustion and early tiredness. Now, if you just go to the pathophysiology of uh, bronchial asthma, what are the factors which triggers bronchial asthma? And if I say that allergens is the most common, why? Because there are certain allergens in environment which can trigger bronchial asthma or hypersensitivity of the smooth muscles. And that is why you might have seen that bronchial asthma usually occurs more during the change of weather, during change of place, during change of uh, environment, during change of working place, working habit because suddenly you are exposed to different type of allergens and many times therefore it is recommended that if you have an history of bronchial asthma when you change the place particularly in a flowering season you must take extra precaution when you are entering into change in the weather particularly from summer to winter or winter to summer there is a sudden exposure of different type of allergens. The chemical sensitizers is another thing particularly industrialization and also certain drugs and also certain chemicals which are acting in the body and sensitize the receptors present in the lungs and the trachea and that can change the system as a hyper responsive. Air pollution is one of the important cause and you might be have noticed that some of the very polluted cities in India like Delhi, Gurgama, like Calcutta and Faridabad, NCR they are high incidence of pollution which is causing absolutely danger signal a warning signal for the entire pulmonary community. Viral infections, several viral infection particularly influenza, dengue and these are the viral in, in, infection which are also initiate which also initiate bronchial asthma or bronchospasm. Incidentally the antibody treatment of these or antigen of these virus changes so frequently that approach to mitigate this is very difficult. These all factors whether chemicals, environment pollution they cause inflammation, inflammation of the respiratory tract and this inflammation causes hyper responsiveness hyperresponsiveness means if we are giving acetylcholine or histamine or any drug which can cause contraction of the smooth muscle in presence of these hyper in presence of the hyperresponsiveness or hypersensitization because of any of these factors there is a severe contraction the contraction lasts longer and that precipitate difficulty in breathing. And this also leads to air flow limitation which is the major cause of discomfort and what is the symptoms are associated with that. Now, if there is a air flow limitation naturally you will understand 
that there is early tiredness, there is a palpitation because the heart is pumping more frequently so as to get oxygen sufficient which is not able to get it and early tiredness fatigue. And the triggering factors as I just talked about are the allergens, exercise, cold air, sulfur dioxide and the sulfur dioxide causes so severe bronchoconstriction of several gases that inhalation of sulfur dioxide has been used as an experimental model to create bronchial asthma in guinea pigs and particulate matters because they go inside and, is, and causes irritation and spasm and that is why in environmental monitoring you might have seen that the particulate matters are important constituents. Now, how do these allergens which are present in the environment when inhaled they cause or precipitate bronchial asthma? The inflammatory cells are recruited in the airway and this cause mast cell activation and this mast cell activation and also deployment of eosinophil and helper T2 cells and this causes release of histamine and this histamine release of histamine and you know that histamine is one of the most powerful bronchoconstructor. So much so that administration of histamine or in the form of aerosol or installation of histamine on trachea, muscles of the trachea are used as an experimental model of bronchial asthma in guinea pig. Prostaglandin D2 which is an autocoid which is also released and this causes microvascular leakage and this microvascular leakage, leakage of of the fluid in the wall this causes swelling of, of the microvascular tissue that causes swelling and that also further reduces the lumen from this size to the small size and that causes edema and this also causes what is called as a mucose mucus hypersecretion there is excess secretion of mucus, there is a dilatation of the blood vessels and because of all this process the lumen further shrinks and increased cholinergic reflex and you know that if there is a cholinergic excessive <coughs> release the bronchus itself gets constriction. Now to summarize the action of allergen is to cause release from the mast cell what is called as a substances of anaphylaxis. These are the histamine, prostaglandin, these are the substances which are called as uh, allergen induced chemicals and cause hypersensitivity of the tissue and there is also the microvascular constriction increased cholinergic tone and all this causes bronchoconstriction. Now if I say that the therapeutic option could be you prevent allergen, you prevent anti-inflammatory or you prevent the release of the substances from the mast cell, you give antagonist of histamine, you give antagonist of prostaglandin D2 and you decreased cholinergic tone and you give direct bronchodilator agent. So, that would become the basic principle of pharmacotherapy. Now, the pathophysiology of the bronchial asthma is in the two lungs and the respiratory tract and therefore, if any drug is given by intravenous route or uh, oral route or by any systemic route will go into the body entire body and 
will go into the lungs and anything which is going into the entire body is causing side effect but anything which is just going into the lungs will be more localized and therefore the drugs in bronchial asthma are primarily given by inhalational route therefore the drugs will reach directly into the site of action and the effect will be localized there will be less drug into the going into what you call as a peripheral compartment and then there will be side effects however if you just see if the bronchus smooth muscle is already too much constricted if this is too much of constriction then the even the inhalation route will not work may work less and that is why you require sometimes intravenous route in emergency situation or oral route because the drug has to go and then it is supplemented that. So, most of the time in general situation the preferred route of administration in bronchial asthma is inhalational route. The advantage is the drug will act locally, the drug will have less side effect, systemic side effect. The limitation is if the contraction is too big then or you require emergency situation that is called as a status asthmaticus you have to give the drug by intravenous route or by oral route. So, the advantage to recap is the dose required is less because it is acting directly into the lungs and the, and the respiratory tract, faster onset of action because it does not have to go to the liver and the entire blood circulation and systemic adverse effect are limited or less. How this can be given by oral route? So, it can be given by aerosol. What is aerosol? If any drug either in the solid powder or as a liquid, if this is suspended into the air by any mechanism, this is called as an aerosol. Now, you see there are three different several of such mechanism have been developed simplest is a dose metered dose inhaler or simple is inhaler and in this area there is a pressurized aerosol and if you just press this lever if you press this lever and a small dose which is metered is released here and you can see that this the dry powder inhaler also and this dry powder is also released mixes into the air and this is a nebulizer. Nebulizer is particularly used in children because in nebulizing system there is also humidifying mechanism by which the drug becomes more smooth. Now there can be different variant of this aerosol doses form. They can be metered, there can be another advancement that will tell you that how much dose is left in this aerosol. So, if there is only 10 dose left you can take another precaution. So, this is all always there are incremental innovation in this administration, but the primary thing is this sends a small amount of dose. Now, when you give the aerosol the important thing is how you train the subject to, to take it and this training with aerosol that they has to press the lever and at the same time should inhale that is the best mechanism and if he is pressing the aerosol and is not inhaling rather exhaling then the drug will not be effective. So, this coordination is important and that is called as a training period with, with inhaler. Many times when the first time person is using first few times it induces cough and that is the time when the physician must give him reassurance that this is the training phase and is important that one should learn and not to leave the inhaler. The important uh, 
quality parameter in inhaler is that the particle size have to be small that is between 10 and uh, micron size because if this is a less than 10 micron size it will go into the lungs and the alveoli and it will come back. When it is more than 100 it will go and it will obstruct it will cause coughing and therefore the ideal size is around 10 micron size so that it goes into the alveoli and acts here and that is why lot of quality assurance goes in to prepare aerosol. Now if I just say what we talked about the pharmacotherapy of bronchial asthma the one is the symptom control primarily today we are looking at the symptom control and that is one way is the giving drugs which will cause bronchodilatation give beta 2 receptor agonist if you recap the primarily the lungs or the respiratory system is supplied by adrenergic mechanism adrenergic mechanism but it also has a cholinergic mechanism now adrenergic mechanism is primarily involved and cholinergic mechanism is less involved adrenergic mechanism again has alpha and beta and in lungs it is a primarily beta involved and of the beta this is the beta 1 and in lungs this is the beta 2. Beta 1 is involved in the heart whereas beta 2 in the lungs. If you have any confusion remember there is a heart is 1 so beta receptor present in the heart is beta 1. There are 2 lungs so the beta receptor present in the lungs are beta 2. Now if you give the beta receptor agonist if you give adrenaline if I say in bronchial asthma it will be the most powerful drug which will cause bronchial relaxation. But can you give adrenaline perhaps not in all situation reason is the adrenaline will act on alpha receptor will cause cardiac issues in hypertension uh, high blood pressure if you give <coughs> but it will be so adrenaline is only given in bronchial asthma in situation where there is an emergency where there is a what is called as a status epileptic status asthmaticus that means it is not controlled by any other agent. So adrenaline is to be given by parenteral route of administration only reserved for status asthmaticus the risk is it can cause serious cardiac issues. Next come is the beta non selective beta agonist isoprenaline which is also not used because it will act on the beta 1 receptor which will produce cardiac arrhythmias hypertension. Therefore the drug of choice in bronchial asthma is selective beta 2 receptor agonist. Now when you say selective in fact there is nothing 100 percent selective they are preferential meaning thereby that even if you give preferential beta 2 receptor agonist the inherent possibility is that this may also stimulate sometimes beta 1 receptor thereby causing cardiac side effects and that is why when you give beta 2 selective also by oral route of administration because of the drug concentration the side effects will there be of cardiac and if you just see one of the most common side effect of beta agonist in bronchial asthma is palpitation that is because of beta 1 receptor are also get stimulated. Now as I mentioned that there is also cholinergic so if the beta 2 agonist are sometimes not fully effective then cholinergic receptor are to be also blocked and you inhibit the cholinergic receptors and that is done by anticholinergic drugs. Now these anticholinergic drugs are 
primarily those which have preferential effect on the respiratory tract. Atropine is not usually used, atropine derivatives are used. <coughs> the other is the methyl xanthines which are directly acting xanthines and causes muscle relaxation. If you just uh, recap the previous slide, there is an inflammatory process because of the leukotriene and the anti-inflammatory drugs are used and those are corticosteroids. In fact, today bronchial asthma is considered to be a disease of inflammation and therefore many times primary treatment starts with low dose corticosteroids. The antigen antibody reaction in the lung starts a release of mediators of inflammation from the master cell and therefore another approach is to stabilize the master cell so that the release of substances of anaphylaxis, substance histamine, 5-HT, serotonin uh, or leukotrienes are not released. The other approach is once they are released, you give the leukotriene antagonist. So uh, just to recap, the, the approach is, the primary approach is beta 2 selective or preferential agonist root inhalation. The other is anticholinergics. Primarily when the beta 2 agonists are not fully effective or you have to supplement that. Third is you can give methyl xanthines and these methyl xanthines are drugs of narrow therapeutic window and therefore they are less preferred. Anti-inflammatory drugs, different type of corticosteroids and preferably again the inhalation corticosteroids and then the mast cell stabilizer. Beta 2 receptor agonist, there are two type of beta 2 receptor agonist. One beta 2 receptor agonist are the drugs which are short acting. These short acting beta 2 receptor agonists are conventionally called as SABA short acting beta receptor agonist. Why they are short acting? Because they are metabolized by catechol amine methyl transferase COMT. So they have a shorter duration of action and the effect lasts for 3 to 6 hours and these are the more commonly used such as salbutamol which is one of the most commonly used beta 2 receptor agonist terbutaline. Long acting which are comparatively resistant to catecholamine methyl transferase and therefore their duration of action is longer and that is phenetarol and also to certain extent terbutaline that is called as LABA, L A B A. So, SABA and LABA are the mainstay in the treatment of bronchial asthma. And when you say LABA, formaterol, solmaterol, salbutamol if you just see is a short acting and derivative is solmaterol is a longer acting, this lasts longer than 12 hours and therefore they are given either once a day whereas the SABA are has to be given more than 3 times or 4 times a day. The drug Villanterol which is a comparatively new drug and Olandeterol, these are much much resistant to COMT and therefore they are primarily used once in 24 hours. So approach of developing new lava is that you give just once day or maybe longer. Uh, more fre less frequency and the drug will act longer. Now why SAVA is used still most of the because this gives quick relief. If I am having a bronchial asthma attack, I will require not LABA but I will require SAVA because this gives quick relief. And usually the LABA 
that means uh, venetrol, valenterol and olandeterol they are used in severe asthma in combination with inhaled corticosteroids because you have to suppress the inflammatory mechanism also. Now, how these beta 2 receptor agonists act? The mechanism is that uh, this agonist will bind to the beta 2 receptor and will stimulate cyclic AMP and this will stimulate the phosphokinase and this will cause a smooth muscle relaxation. Now, if you just see the beta 2 receptor causing the stimulation of adenyl cyclase and then increase in cyclic AMP. Similarly, when we will talk of xanthines, xanthines they also increase cyclic AMP, but by different mechanism. So, many times beta 2 receptor agonists and xanthines are given in combination. Beta 2 receptor agonists can also produce side effects and the main side effect because beta 2 receptor is also present in the muscles and stimulation of beta 2 receptor in the muscles will cause direct effect on this and will cause palpitation the tremors. Now, beta 2 receptor if the person on bronchial asthma getting beta 2 receptor agonist gets a tremor that is the indication that the person is getting high dose of beta 2 receptor agonist and that is the time when you have to reduce the dose or titrate the dose. Any other thing which can cause tremors? Yes, you know that anxiety causes tremors and anxiety tremors is again because of the beta 2 receptor stimulation in the muscles and also and, and therefore, beta 2 receptor blocker are used as anti anxiety for particularly in tremors and that is to correlate that what is the side effect of beta 2 receptor agonist in muscles. Beta 2 receptor because of the non selective or certain some amount of non selectiveness <coughs> this will stimulate the beta 1 receptor also in the heart and in some cases in high doses this will cause increase in heart rate this will cause palpitation and what is palpitation? is increase heart rate, but particularly when the person become conscious of his heartbeat that is called the palpitation and that also many times associated with anxiety. Beta 2 receptor agonist also affects on the uptake of potassium, more potassium goes into the muscle and that leads to hypokalemia restlessness because of the stimulation of the of, of the beta 1 receptors and also in the in the in the brain metabolic effects increase in glucose and therefore diabetics may sometimes get slightly higher blood sugar pyruvate lactate and insulin so that is beta 2 receptor agonist the other arm is because the cholinergic supply also goes up therefore, muscarinic antagonist and what muscarinic antagonist those muscarinic receptor blockers which can be given by inhalational route which have automatically less side effects and these are called as a short x thing that is S A M A SAMA short acting muscarinic antagonist and this is given as a usually 4 times a daily and the drug is ipratropium bromide. The advantage of ipratropium bromide is this can be given by inhalational route this therefore, has a less systemic anticholinergic side effect and the limitation is it has to be given 3 to 4 times a day usually this is given in combination with salvitamol. 
Lama is a long acting muscarinic antagonist requires to be given once a day and this is the drug in this group is tiotropium bromide which is quite commonly used and the other is glycopyronium bromide. These are the two commonly used Lama drugs. The mechanism they block primarily competitive manner the muscarinic M3 receptors which are present in a smooth muscle and causes constriction. Now blocking this will relieve constriction. So now there are two different things beta 2 agonist causes relaxation whereas anticholinergic prevents further constriction. So there are two important things and therefore they are given often in combination. Used in asthma in case are not controlled by beta 2 agonist and preferred in COPD then in asthma to reduce vagal tone. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease which is a much problematic situation they are less responsive to beta 2 agonist and in these cases the vagal tone is already very high therefore the constriction of the smooth muscle is always there and therefore the drugs primarily effective here are those which block or reduce the vagal tone and in these cases ipratropium bromide or tiotropium or glycopyroninonium is used. So if I ask you the drug of choice in COPD is not beta 2 agonist is primarily Lama or Sama but also beta 1 agonist beta 2 agonists are used. The third group is uh, methyl xanthines. And these methyl xanthines are those drugs which are given orally and this is theophylline and doxophylline and intravenously the drug theophylline is, is given in the form of aminophylline. What is aminophylline? Aminophylline is theophylline ethylene diamine. And this ethylene diamine is a very painful therefore it is always given by intravenous route never given by intramuscular route. When you give theophylline by intravenous route because the veins do not have the sensory nerves therefore it is painless but when it gets leaked out of the vein it can cause thrombophlebitis. Mechanism of action is phosphodiesterase inhibition and this causes also increase in cyclic AMP and bronchodilatation. In addition to theophylline acting on adenylcyclase it has also powerful adenosine antagonism and adenosine is also powerful receptor which causes bronchospasm. So theophylline acts by two mechanisms by increasing cyclic AMP adenyl cyclase and by adding a, as a as an antagonism of adenosine. It also has anti inflammatory action. Now therapeutic range is 5 to 15 milligram per liter this range is a narrow therapeutic window. If the range goes low than 5 then this is not effective. If this goes beyond 15 it can cause severe side effects that is it will cause cardiac arrhythmias it can cause conversion therefore the administration of theophylline is not preferred in most of the time. If it is to be given it has to be given very carefully in a titrated manner. In children it has to be given, in adult it has to be given with great caution, not recommended for regular use. Adverse drug reaction, fortunately this adverse drug reaction of theophylline is warning signal. It can cause nausea, severe vomiting, headache and diuresis, cardiac arrhythmias and seizures are the serious side effect.
corticosteroids are those which are preferably can be given by oral route baclomethasone, budesonide and flu fluacticosone. These are the corticosteroids which are commonly used. Mechanism of action as we just talked about, they bind cytoplasmic receptors and uh, this causes gene <coughs> transcription and this causes suppression of the inflammatory process. Use first line therapy in patient with persistent bronchial asthma, not relieve thy corticosteroid, not relieve the bronchial bronchodilator and administered with long acting beta agonist in severe disease condition. Many people also prefer to use low dose of corticosteroid at the beginning also. Systematic corticosteroids, you have to give sometimes systematic steroids as a last option if the symptoms controlled by inhalation mechanism does not work and that is prednisolone. Hydrocortisone intravenous indicated in acute asthma, severe asthma if no improvement with inhaled beta steroid. The adverse drug reaction can be dysphonia, auto oropharyngeal candidiasis particularly when the repeated administration of steroid in the will suppress the immunity of the oral cavity and their candidiasis is most common cough because the this causes irritation. Systematic adrenal suppression, growth suppression, osteoporosis, cataracts, glaucoma precipitation and susceptibility of infection and hyperglycemia precipitation of diabetes. These are the common side effect of systemic administration of corticosteroids. So, corticosteroids will cause mainly if you give repeatedly for long duration cause osteoporosis is an important issue, cataract precipitation, glaucoma, adrenal suppression and susceptibility. The mast cell which causes release of the substances because of uh, some stimulus and the drug which covers the mast cell core or that is called as a mast cell stabilizers and these mast cell stabilizer are most commonly used is chromolin sodium. The other mast cell stabilizer is nodochromyl sodium. Chromolin sodium and nodochromyl sodium they are usually given as a long term strategy. The problem or the limitation that this does not act immediately and mass so mechanism of action stabilizes the mast cell and inhibit the activation and release of uh, the meta mediators not recommended for regular use. Favorable side effect profile they are usually innocuous but the efficacy is also low and inhalers requires burdensome daily washing to avoid blockage because this causes blockage and the and this is not so easy to administer. Now another group of drug is leukotriene antagonist that is if you know that there are two type of leucoarachidonic acid one is the cox and other is lipooxygenase lox. Now, cyclooxygenase cox is converts this into prostaglandin which causes bronchorelaxation center. Now, that is the reason why if you give aspirin it blocks the cox and therefore, many times aspirin induces or precipitates bronchial asthma. So, if I ask you why aspirin can precipitate bronchial asthma, the answer is the aspirin blocks the cyclooxygenase enzyme which reduces the conversion of beneficial prostaglandin and therefore, in susceptible patients the bronchial asthma can be induced by aspirin or non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. Now, LOX or lipooxygenase converts leukotrienes which are bronchoconstructor agents 
and therefore the treatment would be you give leukotriene antagonist receptor blockers and which will be beneficial. And the LOX inhibitors xylutone is a LOX inhibitor not so commonly used now, but the leukotriene receptor antagonists which are commonly used and but they are expensive relatively is Monteleucast, Zephyrleucast and other derivatives of the same thing. So, primarily Monteleucast and Zephyrleucast these are the leukotriene receptor antagonist agents. Not recommended they are not recommended for regular use less effective than inhaled corticosteroids. Initial controller treatment of patient unable or unwilling to use inhaled corticosteroids in these situation leukotriene antagonists are used with concomitant allergic rhinitis because in allergic rhinitis this is a continuous process entire season in that case the leukotriene antagonists are used. Magnesium sulphate is not a common drug used for bronchial asthma, but it is effective along with used uh, with beta 2 agonist and 2 gram intravenous over 20 minutes is used, but this is only used when the beta 2 receptor fails. Repeated doses because the magnesium goes into the muscle, this causes muscle weakness and it has a danger of causing respiratory failure also. So, is now these are the other group of drugs which are uh, monoclonal antibody which are I will not go into the detail because they are still not so commonly used. Now, lastly mucolytic agents though they are not uh, primarily as a bronchial asthma drugs, but if you just remember then bronchial asthma the the lumen is narrowed, there is a bronchial inflammation leading to the mucus secretion and the mucus secretion becomes thick and that also causes further difficulty in breathing. And therefore, mucolytics are often used in bronchial asthma though they are not classical bronchodilators. So, agent that enhances bronchial secretion, so you enhance bronchial secretion more more liquid bronchial secretion this will reduce the viscosity of already thick bronchial secretion. Now, act directly on mucoproteins and this will liquefy mucus and lowering the viscosity and therefore, person will require less effort to expel it out and therefore, this is available usually with antitussive agents. Drugs, mucolytics are uh, bromhexene embruxol, acetylcysteine these are the enzymes which break the bondage between the pep proteins and peptides. And so, this is if I just ask you to summarize the bronchial asthma is the disease where there is a hypersensitivity of the respiratory system associated with the primarily the inflammatory condition. Therefore, the treatment is to give bronchodilators in the form of beta 2 receptor agonist. Preferable route of administration is uh, local means inhalation. The problem with inhalation that it has to be trained and the particle size have to be maintained, the quality control has to be maintained, but it can also cause the systemic side effect because it can in high dose stimulate the beta 1 receptor in the heart and cause palpitation. Tremors is the main first indication of overdose toxicity. Theophylline is another drug which can cause increased cyclic MP by different mechanism. Therefore, xanthines and beta 2 agonists are often given in combination. Beta 2 receptors are often given in combination with corticosteroid inhalation agent particularly for long term treatment in bronchial asthma which is more of rhinitis origin or allergic origin or seasonal origin the leukotriene antagonist Monteleucast is the preferred agent. And in serious bronchial asthma when there is not responding to, to inhalation route one may give what is called as a status asthmaticus 
they have to be intravenous theophylline, intravenous uh, adrenaline, uh, subcutaneous adrenaline and lastly in the status asthmaticus the patient has to be nebulized, the patient has to be given by a oxygen therapy. So, if any question we will respond now or maybe in next session. Thank you.